Okay, shall we start or wait a few more minutes? I think that we can start, right? Uh, okay, so today we're gonna jump to a different subject and just uh, we're trying to look at some uh, basic principle on the science of food and cooking. So we will see the difference of uh, the approach taken from a chemistry point of view and from a physics point of view as well. Okay, so we're not we are not going to learn how to cook, okay? But uh, because you have to teach me eventually how to do that. But uh, we're trying to look at all those processes that might have an influence, or we will try to understand why some things happened and uh, what some others uh, don't. So before we start, or before jumping into the actual subject, remove this one, um, we, um, I have to refresh some basic concepts, okay? So we will see some uh, scientific content to try to place us into the picture. And then we will see examples associated with that. But basically the idea is uh, quite simple. Okay, do we have a scientific way or of looking how the food is processed um, and eventually the uh, processing is, does it have a scientific explanation? We take it for granted, right? So we know what to do. We know that we have to do this uh, in a certain way and uh, then we do have the Italian touch, the Maltese touch, the Indian touch or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's not something that we should, or obviously for the daily life, it's fine. But from a scientific point of view, it's not granted. And uh, also, just uh, as a little note, the learning curve that humanities or human beings has taken in order to improve the cooking, the preservation of the stuff that eventually uh, are produced from agriculture, from hunting and stuff, obviously had changed through time. And as long as like technologies experience in any indirect way have taken over, this have been like customary. There are things that actually very little changed uh, since since the beginning, okay? And some others are, uh, we will see later on, still are happening at the same time with just some different touches here and there to guarantee obviously the food security and uh, several other things. But in general, everything I think can be intended to be science driven. What does it mean? That in everything that we do, including cooking, food processing, or anything, or even the process that actually happened to the food itself. So for example, in here we do have a statement, do we wonder why some bananas turn brown at a certain point? Or eventually, if we don't act on a piece of meat at a certain point, that piece of meat will just... Uh, uh, deteriorate and will not be uh, good enough to be eaten anymore. So all these things are de definitely, they have a scientific base. So we can use science, scientific principle to explain why things are happening, like anything else that we saw uh, eventually so far. 
And uh, also we will look at some curiosity if simple actions that I can make, like boiling an egg, actually could have like some differences and can be seen in terms of uh, chemistry. So what happened to the components of the eggs or eventually from a physics point of view, if boiling the eggs over here on top of the Himalayas will change something, okay? And um, obviously this is a kind of a basic statement and a little bit silly, but it's, it has been always there. It's a kind of a true statement and it's still, it's there, that food is the driving uh, factor for our human needs. And actually the food control is uh, something that it's how, of utmost importance even today, okay? Uh, in general, we can treat food, any kind of food that we look at, such like complex mix, mixture of, uh, of chemicals. And we will see now, obviously we are not going to deep in into the chemistry of it, but we're going to at least in a pictorial form, looking at this chemistry formulations, the way that looking at the simplest and odd element that we do have looking at foods that could be water, that is very, very simple. But then water has a very kind of strange physical behavior. Up to more complex uh, elements and complex food, we do have, at least from a pictorial point of view, let's say from the chemi uh, chemistry representation, we will see and we'll start appreciating that the structure and the way we represent it's complex as we talk of different things. Okay, so for example, we will see that if we talk about proteins or sugar, they don't they they will be not represented in the same way. We use two different words, so it means that they must be different, but we will see that one is much more complicated than the other, okay? So we'll try to grasp all, uh, all, this thing, all, uh, all these things. And um, cooking is a, as a science or is a science as well? Uh, the answer is yes. Right, because uh, we need to follow some recipes, but the even the environmental condition. So, if we consider that as an experiment, the, even the environmental conditions needs to be controlled or eventually known in order to do that particular process. Okay, and this obviously is for many reasons that we already uh, mentioned. And. Uh, Obviously, from uh, a strictly speaking and uh, daily life point of view, cooking, it's a kind of, could be a kind of rigorous process. And uh, there is the way that uh, we tackle in a rigorous process. So, for example, like waiting exactly to the list uh, of the gram uh, or whatever, like using that specific ingredient and not anything that looks like but is not and stuff like that and even if we change something into the process uh, eventually the end product will be very close to it but not exactly what we want right so and actually from this point of view just to get a little bit off from uh, from topic we do have two school of thought right following exactly step by step gram by gram by gram what it says, or eventually have an artistic touch to it and say, ah, oh, whatever, 10 grams or 11 grams doesn't make any difference to this. And, you know, and then, so, but that from a scientific point of view, obviously can alter a bit the conditions of um, or the, final, uh, the final product. Um, and uh, obviously each component that we do have or anything that we do and we take it for granted actually have a precise 
scientific process behind. So, for example, like we uh, need to look at the function of each of these components that we do have listed in here. Acid, base, proteins, fat, carbohydrates. So all these things, they do have a specific meaning. So they do have a particular shape from a scientific point of view. So a particular shape of the molecules, of the distribution of the atoms and stuff. And, um, and because of this, they will, uh, let's say, react is not the right word, but uh, to different kind of uh, approach. So they will react differently to the heat. They will react differently in uh, some particular conditions and, uh, and stuff like that. So we'll try to see what um, it's special about them and eventually if we do have also different levels if we can look at that piece of meat just as a piece of meat or eventually at a series of a complex mixture of uh, different components uh, obviously we can get this even to introduce what we call the scientific method i think we already mentioned this in several other um, or few other subjects that we looked at but the what the scientific method is so let's start with this uh, approach and uh, that should be scientifically sound to produce ice cream it's something that we like at least i do and um, so the how can we make fat free ice cream how we can reduce such components so we can separate eventually some of the components that we don't want uh, and then make an ice cream so we do have to formulate an hypothesis in general so um, so this hypothesis is, is in general in this example or any other kind of scientific experiment that we can think of um, will be the driving factor for the experiment that we're going to carry and to try to prove and to see if that's one it's okay and uh, so we need to solve the problems and design a certain experiment in such a way that this experiment can support the hypothesis, the hypothesis or eventually says no this hypothesis doesn't stand because i cannot replicate it okay so and um, the design of the experiment then has to be done in a certain way that once we set the way of conducting that particular experiment we can reproduce towards uh always okay so if i do that particular process if i do test that hypothesis with that scientific experiment then anyone else using exactly the same approach has to be able to replicate and to get the same results that's what we mean with scientific method so we do have a kind of a cooking recipe in which we follow some steps there is nothing magical and if anyone can do it anyone else should be able to do it and replicate the process okay if we don't follow that scientific method so if we don't have an hypothesis and we can have something that testifies that that hypothesis is a true statement or the same way the same way it's a false statement that is not a scientific approach okay then uh, uh, we go in some other in some other field in general sorry this is like uh, small i will try to read it for you but in generally in general everything starts with observations so observation means that i do have a certain phenomenon am i conducting an experiment now not really but i'm observing but i'm going towards that right because i'm observing if i let this mask go 
no matter what I do, and no matter if I do like at this height or this height, or with this hand or my left hand, or this side of the table or this side of the table. I'm making my mask very dirty, but that's, that's another story. But in general, I'm start observing something, right? What do I observe? I observe that no matter what, I do have some certain common factor that actually are trying to conduct me and to drive me towards a certain hypothesis and say, oh, I do have a mask. But what happened if I do the same exercise with this object, which is a mobile phone, and it's like a little bit heavier? I do from this height. Oh, see, it does the same, right? So hmm, I'm making these observations in my daily life. This happened with the silly, exper this silly experiment, but uh, it also happens quite regularly, like on anything, right? And uh, then I start posing some questions to myself and say, hmm, why is this happening? Why do I have always this kind of behavior? Why, if I let this go, doesn't go up or it doesn't deviate in any kind of uh, context? And, oh, gee, instead of being into the air, if I do the same experiment into the water, there are some conditions that actually give me the same net result, right? If I drop this mobile phone into the water, it will sink more or less in the same way it will sink into the, the air, right? So I start then making some hypotheses, okay? This hypothesis will allow me to actually, and the bunch of observation that I'm making to actually taking out some predictions, okay? Now, we need to be careful when we use the words prediction, because in science, what we name with the terms prediction, it's different from what a magician eventually will think about prediction, right? Or whoever, I don't know if it's common in here, but they can, uh, they have this fortune teller that they can tell you your future, so make prediction on your future, just looking at a, whatever, a crystal board or like playing cards or whatever, right? So that's a different kind of prediction. Doesn't have anything to do with science, okay? Uh, my personal comment, it does have with fooling people, but that's uh, my personal comment out of this class. And um, within the, the scientific method, what we think and what we, um, define in terms of prediction is that I can literally from the etymology of the word say before prediction that if I let any object go it will follow it will fall and always it will follow a certain way and a certain pattern so eventually I can predict that if I let this phone go from a, a height of one meter, it will take whatever, one second to go down and to reach the ground. If I let it go from a height of 10 meters, the time that it will take, it will be larger than if let it go from one meter, right? Because the height is larger. Now, all these things, and with this example, everything say, but well, it's granted. It's, uh, but don't think just with this example. Use this example to visualize things. And also, eventually, I like to do this exercise to trace it back in the human history as well. So you, we have to compare human history and how long it took okay, which is a nil time, basically, very close to zero in respect to the time of the entire planet. Okay, let's remind us, we had that little experiment uh, a few weeks ago, but it took a while before understanding those processes. And then it took even longer because the scientific method, it's something that is in place since a few centuries, 
now. Uh, it took a while before having a clear picture. It's like having a, a, a baby, right? I experimented and I went this with my little daughter, right? So when she was born, one year, well, I mean, one day old or two days old, she obviously, she was observing and learning and starting to keep and build up, build up, build up. And she's still doing it, right? And we're still doing it, even if we are like at a later stage. And this obviously has to be taken in parallel with the humankind activities, right? So what we now learn and it's customary for our children to learn in the second, third year of their uh, school. Okay, let's think about, uh, I don't know, adding numbers, right? It's something that's, oh, but it's, it's normal. No, it's normal, but human and as a human beings and societies had, had to go through a very long process before to get to that point. So it's a kind of learning curve that is still um, occurring. So once I do have, let's go back to the scientific method. Once we do have this prediction, so I can predict what's gonna happen, it means that I'm starting formulating a way of conducting that experiment mentally without actually having any devices, right? So I have, a physical law, eventually, that we will drive the prediction for the next experiment, okay? And then, of course, this could be even a little bit complicated and some things can, be, uh, can change uh, along the line. But in general, we do have some results and some conclusions. If those results are, can be reiterated, or they can be a little bit modified. The hypothesis can modify. We do make like a more complex experiment and we go on in this kind of iterative way. Um, so in general, from an observation or a phenomenon, we create a question. So the, we observe that phenomenon and then we do have some hypothesis. We test them, okay? In testing them, the key factor and the taking on message is that if I test it, I obtain some results. If that is a true statement and I did uh, this following a scientific method, then anyone else can replicate, okay? Now, from this point of view, if we go back to the storyteller or the fortune teller, if they read my future within the cards, it's not a scientific approach besides the fact that it's valid or not. We don't enter into this, okay? But if it, it will follow a scientific approach, if I take like two seconds after the same settings, so the same card, I will do the same and I will tell the same story and the same prediction, right? Because a different, uh, the same experiment, has been conducted by a different person, and at that point, the results must be the same. Yeah. Ah, yes, <laughs> but he can replicate the result, right? Yes, but then why it can happen? Why a different, that's a very nice question that I will reuse in the future, but why a different magician can replicate the same result? Because actually, underneath that trick, there is a scientific explanation, right? So if we follow exactly the same thing, right? Or if, we, if that magician released the way that experiment is conducted, okay? Then anyone can replicate that, right? It's like the vaccine, right? <laughs> now, this vaccine, it's scientifically proven, but not everyone can replicate, right? There is a big debate going on, like does being 
has to be produced like outside the factories that actually invented them and so on. But obviously they follow the scientific method. Now, if they're going to produce and to redo that experiment in a different factory or on a different company, the, re the net results must be the same, okay? That's a scientific approach. Then obviously in that particular case, there are economic interests and stuff that uh, will go outside the scientific approach, but that's another story, but in general. So our main questions, once we do have this kind of tools in general, in principle, for the scientific method, we saw that eventually science, uh, food, it's like any other object in nature, made of uh, different components. The main question we have is science, is it going to impact food? Can we look food from a scientific perspective? And of course, like anything else, and uh, we are going to look mainly into the chemistry, so we do have four main components when we're looking about uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the food um, topics. is the biology, so understand how that particular tissue, either from uh, vegetables or plants or um, animals, eventually work and so on. We are not going to look into that for now. Eventually, chemistry, so it's another branch of science that gets into it, so how the reactions will modify the molecular uh, structure and uh, how several factors can um, make a difference in the I, both in the food processing, food conservation and so on. So um, why, for example, in here it's written, why do we have rancid butter? Why it does go? Uh, bad, that one or anything else. It's the um, oxidized process of the fats that takes place. Eventually, we do have some components coming from physics in which the study of the matter and energy and mainly thermodynamic processes can regulate and influence the food processing. And Eventually, the engineering uh, side, which is an aspect of the applied physics, that we will see has a very important component uh, in the daily production of food. Obviously, we don't have several other combinations of those, right? Because we do have uh, components now with the new science that are not confined anymore in their traditional words in chemistry or physics. We do have a lot of biochemistry, biophysics, or um, bioengineering, uh, whatever, like even, but that's, it's like something more complicated in, um, in terms of looking at this. Let's start uh, from the basic approach. And uh, the first, it's like food chemistry, versus food uh, physics. Do they look at the same aspects? Definitely the answer would be immediately no, because we saw this from the previous slide, right? In which we do have something that belongs to the physics domain, okay? Like at the subfield of science and something that belongs to the chemistry domain. So two different things that actually act on that food, but in a different way. And we will see now why, okay? Uh, what is food physics or food chemistry? Is the same. Now, we are trying to look at the food physics to answer this uh, difference between the, the question about the difference food chemistry and food physics. Uh, and obviously, what doesn't belong to the food physics in this context belongs to the food chemistry. 
Okay, so one big difference is between food physics and food chemistry is that chemistry is all about transformation and reaction of molecules. Okay, so we are changing the structure of that food. Okay, so different molecules go in those uh, in this, uh, uh, in those that come out. Okay, physics in general keep the same molecules. So we we in this approach we keep and we will keep the same structure, but based on the environment, these molecules might behave very differently. Okay, so if we look at the transformation of water from solid to liquid to gas okay the molecule will be always the same it's going to be always water right but we are changing some physical conditions okay and what is acting on it is some environmental processes okay so we are dropping or increase the heat factor so the temperature of that particular subject of that particular uh, environment and that system takes has a different shape now just allow me a little uh, parenthesis in here on um, how the water it's really really fascinating and there's some properties that science still didn't fully understand but actually are and we know that water is one of the uh, things that are actually necessary and needed for life, right? But also, they have it's as a as a material. Let's call it this way, uh, not in the proper way, but let's call it material for sake of uh, simplicity. It has some uh, amazing and really fascinating behavior. First of all, what happens when we do have this water? In a liquid form and we decrease the temperature of the environment in which this water is placed so we place this bottle into the freezer what's gonna happen it will freeze ice, ice. ice. so it changed like the physical uh, component the like, physical uh, property so from liquid it became a solid but what kind of properties this solid has yes please yes but we will go into that yes but also what happens like in a microscopic way for now at this material it will surely expand right and it becomes lighter so a piece of ice can float right and also it solidifies so it becomes as a so in the solid state in the upper part first so that's what happens into the lakes right and it takes a while eventually to actually freeze the entire column of water so in a lake it's practically impossible but that's that's really uh important from this kind of behavior it's really important for maintaining the life cycles on the planet right and in some particular extreme conditions because even if the upper part is frozen life underneath can go on right so fish they're still there eventually like in the arctic uh, they're like mammals that still will uh, do their stuff on top eventually they learn that this ice is not infinite thick and they can drill let's say or uh, excavate a bit and just get in and out from the water and so and so forth also this process like from a physics point of view what does it do that it's reversible right because i can then increase the temperature again and from solid water ice i will get back to liquid form and then i can increase the temperature again 
and from liquid status, we can act on that and having uh, in a gas form, right? And we can reverse those processes. Now, um, so these molecules behave differently subject to a variation of temperature. So subject to different environmental conditions. Okay. Now we look, we'll try to look at some of these things uh, from a chemistry and a physics point of view, and we'll try to follow this order. We look at something from a chemistry point of view. Some of the things I'm going to show you just to visually understand that they are complex, more complex, and we'll just go in escalating and increasing the complexity of the system. And then once we have an overview and we associate some things to, to uh, some particular chemistry component, then we will move into the physics. And then in daily uh, application, engineering application of food uh, processing and even way of we maintain them. So, just let me allow me to check if we're still recording. Because if internet goes off, yes. Just for the. Uh, uh, so let's start with the basic, right? I think that we mentioned this already, but we never saw a picture of it. In general, we do have we talk about atoms, right? That from this point of view, they are the building blocks of the matter in general. In our case, we're looking at some particular form of matter that is food. Okay, so we don't have this atomic model. And this atomic model, it's composed and consists of three main uh, class of particles that are called the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons, okay? The protons and the neutrons stays concentrated at the center in this um, region of the space, because even if they're tiny, even if we're talking about very, very, very little distances, still it's uh, space. So they are confined at the center of this uh, space. And then the electrons, which carry a negative charge, will just rotate all around. That's the atom. That's that kind of representation. We call it Bohr atomic model, okay? In which we do have the center, which is charged mainly in a positive manner because it's made up of neutron and protons. The protons carry a, a positive electrical charge, while the neutrons are neutral. So like Switzerland, they don't carry uh, anything, but they have, even like Switzerland, a very important weight and factor into the atomic model. And then we do have orbiting, all the electrons uh, that occupy several orbits. And obviously, the way they occupy the orbits is not random. There is a specific way they can do and they have to follow. And, um, and they orbit around the nucleus. OK? Um, I will tell you the story of the importance of the neutrons inside the nucleus like later on maybe next time when we look at some particular aspects uh, that are necessary for example for dating uh, an object okay just uh, to anticipate a little bit just one little thing how do we know that I'm not old. Usually I make this example with a different audience and usually I say I'm older than you, but in here I have to reverse. Mm -hmm. That I'm not older than you, I guess. Um, we can either compare, right? 
So it will, you can tell that I'm younger than another one or older than another individual by comparing, okay? So we do have a kind of stratigraphy way and we, right? Or exactly in the scale, or eventually we need some kind of uh, scientific process, which in modern society is called ID card that actually can tell exactly when I was born. Okay, and that's something that we will see in this particular context next week. We will see how does it work for dating objects. But let's go back to our atomic model. Okay, so in general, the atoms are different because they do have a different number of protons or electrons. Okay, so we'll start with the simplest, which is the uh, hydrogen that has one proton and one electron, going then increasing the number of those. Let's say the second one is going to be the helium that has two protons and two electrons. So if it has two protons and each of them has a mass, it means that helium is heavier than hydrogen, right? And so forth when we go along. So there is a way to actually schematize this in a kind of, in a table, which is the one that you see up here, that is called periodic table. And like a dictionary, a very good di dictionary for a translator from Latin to English, Latin to Italian, it's a very useful tool, right? That, uh, dictionary for translating things because you can read a lot and it's a valid tool the uh, periodic table can be read by the chemistry uh, and chemistry approach in such a way that the periodic table carries a lot or contains a lot of information that a chemistry can use because all the elements for example are ordered according to their weight according to the atomic mass we eventually know um, some other properties that will allow one element to mix or react with something uh, with some other elements okay or eventually we know also and this classified as well that there are some elements that they don't want to mix with the others, okay? That's what we call the noble gases, right? I guess that the name comes in parallel with the society, right? There was a time, I don't know if it's still there, but in which some part of society doesn't, didn't want to mix with something stranger. And uh, with a certain extent, it's the same over here. So there are some elements that are stable, they are in good conditions, and they don't need, they don't want to mix with some others, obviously obeying at some particular rules. And in particular are the ones that are on this part of the table, in this column over here. Helium is the lighter of them, is, uh, is one, okay? All the others instead are not, we say they are not stable. So they need, not to change, we will uh, see this when they change when next time, but in general, they need to be combined and to form molecules in order to stabilize, okay? So helium can stay on its own. It has enough to stay on its own, but... Um, Hydrogen, for example, cannot. And in some particular condition, it has to be combined with some others. So, for example, with oxygen, and we do have water. Okay? But they can, they need, that's the, that's the difference. Now, in this periodic table, we do have all the elements, all the atoms that actually we can find in uh, nature. And there are also some elements that have been created in the lab, and some of them are really, really unstable. So they can survive 
into the environment for a very short amount of time. From a biochemical point of view, okay, so if we look and go back to our topic of the day, which is food, so biology is involved now that we do have biochemical component, very few or just a few of them are uh, taken uh, into consideration. So those are the uh, ones that we do have. So the white, white cells over here is the one that they don't belong to the sub branch of biochemical uh, um, elements, okay? Elements in red are present in bulks and living things. And if we look at some of them, H stands for hydrogen, O for oxygen, C for carbon, okay? Those are elements that are very much present in the biochemical components, okay? And they are, they are essential. Our um, way of even picture life, it's based on carbon, and water. So carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. This is the three key elements, obviously, not just those, but those are very, very important. Then since food is made of material from living things, those elements are the most important to the science of food and cooking, okay? Because in order to survive and to keep going, either if we like it or not, we need to eat and have nutrition through other living objects or living things, plants or animals, but we need to have supplies of all these elements from, uh, from them. So cooking will go with that. The element in, in yellow, are trace elements that are very likely essential for lice. So, for example, we do have in here um, sodium, calcium, uh, chlor chlorine, chlorine, whatever, chloro in Italian, chlorine. So, and those are in trace, zincium, copper, iron, and, and so forth. So those are trace elements, and the elements in blue uh, are present in some organisms and might be essential for, uh, for life, okay? So what we call all the minerals that at the end of the day we need to assume and to get in order to have some uh, functions be uh, carry on, carried on. Obviously, let's not forget that us as a human being or any other kind of uh, living object are based on these elements. But obviously, those elements will uh, be part of a more complex picture that we do have. For example, we cannot have too much iron as a mineral, right? But still, we need some. If we don't have, some components in our biological process and some steps into the our biological complex will go nuts, right? And the same if we do have a certain abuse of some others, uh, then some it, it will have repercussion on something else. So we are not looking at this from this point of view, but let's keep it in mind that the right balance of things are uh, really, really important in order to conduct uh, certain processes, okay? Let's go to two simple uh, basic uh, concepts in chemistry that actually are important even in food and even in some cooking process. And I'm sure if you just read the red word uh, on top and we do have acids and base, you can actually most probably recall something. And, uh, 
and um, everything it's I mean everything from this point of view um, acid and base can be allocated on a scale okay from 0 to 14 and we do have some of them that are more rich in acidic component okay so we do have this kind of sore even taste and um, uh, component and uh, okay here it says where it's coming from it's coming from a latin latin a latin term uh, acetum that it's related to the acidus so it's the acidus component and for example vinegar is one of as component of uh, uh, of this kind so acid component okay and that's what we call acetic um, acid but we do have some other acids that uh, eventually are produced into the our muscles uh, lactic acid right and uh, last week for example we saw that the lactic acid not not we sorry in slima and the forensic class that we are uh, conducting there but we saw that the acid acid component and the proportion of this can actually it's one of the factors that the anatomy the pathologist the medical doctor that actually has to carry out the autopsy from a legal point of view it's one of the elements that he looks at to establish the time of that okay or this in the other way around the lactic acid can um, camouflage let's say the true um, time of that uh, of a certain of a certain thing so that's something that we produce into uh, our body for se in several conditions then we do have the fruit acid the citric acid is one of those and we use this for cooking and we will see ah yes we do it and uh, oxalic acid is another one so all of them belong that class of uh, elements that are into the reddish part of this kind of scale okay then there are like in the middle there are like some that are neutral and we use this uh, kind of scale quite uh, extensively not just for food but several things right and what we call the ph scale and this has been it's used for detergents and uh, soaps and several things right on the right hand side we do have alkaline uh, elements let's say in which they act in a different way and now we'll see the combination eventually one can need neutralize the other and we will see a few uh, examples okay now we will we are going to start seeing diagrams like this okay that's the way the chemistry people are actually representing the molecules so the combination of several um, atoms okay and their complexity so the molecules are much more complex in some cases and therefore their representation because they combine more elements or group of elements it becomes a little bit more complex obviously we are not going into the details there is a way on how these things are structured but we will use them as a visual help to actually try to understand that some of the things are much more complex than others just because they are written or represented in a more complex manner okay and uh, okay so as you can see we do have um, some uh, different way of representing of representing uh, the acid that we just mentioned and those are some food sources that actually contain that particular acid so even if we talk about an acid okay the fact that we have to represent 
depict them in different way in a more or less, less complicated manner. The fact that we are representing them in different way, it means that even though they belong to the same class, they will have their own particularities, okay? They're not the same. They belong to that class, but they will not be exactly the same to each other, okay? Like us, we belong to the human beings, but then at a certain point we are, if we just zoom in, uh, Europeans and then uh, Southern Europeans that we, like the Mediterranean, the things are act differently from the Northern European. And then we are like uh, Maltese. And then from Maltese, I'm, uh, I don't know, from this village. And from this village, I belong to this parish or that parish. And from this parish, I belong to this family or this family, this portion of that family and portion of the family. Still, it's like different kind of grouping. Now, it's a silly way of representing things. But even though we look like all the same or we are called in the same way, we do have some particularities and peculiarities. Yes, sir. I thought you were mentioning parish. No. Yes. Thing to study. Yes. For example, you take an apple and place a banana, first of all, you measure the neutrons, protons, and electrons of an apple. Hello. Mostly the green one. Now, you experiment, you know, you have a scale. Then you place a banana with another apple, like it, but the same. The electrons will change their position. And there will be a reaction between the apple and the banana. And the banana will smell, itself and it with another scale. Then, and not the same apple, but a different apple, the green one, you place it, a kiwi with an apple, and you see another different position, transfer of electrons, first, then the, 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 the acids, Exactly. Well, yeah. Right. As and they react different. But they why? Exactly. Why is this happening? Because of the acid. There is the. Exactly. It's not electrons that going back and forth, but it's the same like when we make, uh, I don't know the English name, like it's the chopped fruit. It's in Italian, it's called Macedonia, right? And. Uh, Fruit salad, right? We do cut apple. That goes into the oxygenase, oxidize, right? So the oxygen into the air will actually take over. And that's why the apple will become, start becoming given, eh? it turns brown, exactly, change colors. But what do we do if we want whiskey lemon? Because it has seed, um, citric acid like the kiwi that has the citric acid okay so it's not actually the electrons going back and forth but it's the reaction and the combining like alkaline and uh, and acid exactly that eventually gets to neutral um uh, neutron position right the same kind of experiment also we put like some um uh, soda bicarbonate, right? Even like if the tomato sauce, eh? baking soda, exactly. If eventually, like if the tomato sauce is a little bit acid, or to eliminate that acidity, that eventually would some people might not like, like like a teaspoon or whatever, like the right quantity according to whatever we're cooking, and we place something that is alkaline. And that obviously will eliminate and go and ne neutralize the um, acid present in the tomato, right? Also, even with milk, but now we'll look at this. And another example of using these things in um, daily life, uh, maybe you remember, I still have in my... Uh, grandmother house this kind of big pot copper pot right 
and before doing the conserva, they used to cut the bad tomatoes, right? Uh, that cannot be used for doing the tomato sauce and just going around because that is acid, right? So it helps in cleaning and the internal part of this uh, copper, uh, copper structure uh, big pot, okay? And uh, so there are like several applications that we use this in, um, in daily life. Not the not the two because they will stay always H two O. But uh, sorry, the molecules exactly because and even when we go into gas form, it's not that it, hydrogen will go on one side and oxygen will go on one side. It's like having this is H H two O. This is H2O as well, and this is H2O as well, okay? So let's imagine we don't have a link between them. This link is going to be stronger into the solid component, and they are back, and then they will be spread out, but the H2O form will stay H2 form, okay? It's just that one, two, and three would be dispersed in a larger in a larger place. Okay, but the elements, the molecule, is the same. We always have water. Okay. Five minutes break. Yes.